Thanks for joining us in today's um, speaker panel session on wellness and caring for dementia. I'm Tiffany Chow, and I will be uh, kicking us off today. Um, and uh, we're not going to speak for 20 minutes exactly each. Um, we're going to try to be a little more interactive. Um, I am a behavioral neurologist uh, who's been on faculty at USC, and that's that's how I got an invitation to present some of this really um, heartfelt work to you today. And I am really proud to be joined by Reverend O'Rourke, who um, will share some of the programming at uh, Montecedro, which is, happens to be where my mom lives, uh, which is how I know how impressive the work is. And Dr. Yuri Zhang from the Royal Institute on Aging. Um, I've had many wonderful uh, collaborations with the USC School of Social Work and um, this is the most recent of them. So just so happy to be presenting to you uh, as a group today. We have no disclosures. Um, and uh, I'm gonna lead off by uh, recount recounting a story. I met someone at a party uh, who asked if I was a writer because there were lots of writers at the party. And I said, no, actually I'm not. I'm just here with a friend who is a writer. And she said, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a behavioral neurologist and I specialize in dementia, patients with dementia and their families. And she said, oh, how can you stand to do that? You seem like such a pleasant person. Doesn't it get you down? And I said, wow, no, I, 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 I never thought of it that way. And she said, you should write a book. And she turned out to be a literary agent. So I did write a book with her help um, and it's called The Memory Clinic. And friends have asked, well, so what's the book about? Is it a textbook? And I said, no, it's actually not a textbook. Um, what I have discovered in talking with the literary agent about what are those things that keep me going as a caregiver to the caregivers um, happen to fall into line with Buddhist tenets. Um, and so the book is really kind of the Dharma of dementia, although the publishers did not want to call it that. Um, and by caregivers today, I mean both those formal caregivers who are those of us who have, may have some uh, medical training or other training to support other people in their time of need and informal caregivers, which are family members or friends who are trying to pitch in and help when there's difficulty. Um, and if you're, if you're gonna fall asleep for the next 15 minutes, <laughs> my main take home point is going to be safe, loved, happy, and healthy. These are like the building blocks of succeeding as a caregiver. And uh, I am joined by uh, Brian and Yuri today because we had a few threads of this in common. Um, the fear of separation, the fear of losing, dependent, uh, losing independence, the stigma of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, can really work against our ability to succeed uh, as community members and as people informally or formally caring for dementia. And so we'll talk with you about exactly that. Um, as I was writing the book, I um, was trying to think of a good analogy for what it's like being in a clinic where you're seeing the, the, the patient and some family members maybe once every three months. Um, to check on medications and new symptoms and things like that. And um, actually the, the woman on the right of this slide is herself a caregiver to a patient with an early onset dementia. And her release, her respite came through exercising. And she was like one of those human thoroughbreds who can do elite triathlete competitions. And she qualified for the Ironman championships in Kona where I was spending a lot of time. And so it just so happened that I was going to be there during the championships. And I made a friend who ran the volunteers. In Hawaiian, the word kokua means support or to provide care. And so um, all of the volunteers get to wear these kokua t-shirts. That's her daughter sitting next to, standing next to me. And we were volunteering at the transition station where as they run by, having just changed out of their bike shoes or out of their swimsuits, we give them what they say they want as they run by. It could be water, could be Gatorade, could be orange slices, could be banana, please. And we were trained to wait for the call and then hand them the thing that they wanted in a hurry. I relayed this training to the athletes 
after they were done with their race. And I was very surprised to hear they just laughed their heads off. They said, we have no idea what we want when we come through there. We are crazy with planning the next move, wondering if our time is good, wondering if we're going to collapse on the course. And we just want something. And it's up to you to give it to us. And as a neurologist with a nurse and a social worker and a speech and language pathologist on my team, I realized it's up to us to figure out what they need and then help them to get it. So one of the things they need is a reality check. And I, um, I did not have time to put this on the recommended reading list, but it's a wonderful small book called One Drum by Richard Wagamese. And um, there are some concepts about humility that really hit home with me. And to remind the caregiver of their humility in the face of life changes that were not expected, not wanted. Part of that humility is to ask yourself very and answer honestly, am, am I actually the problem? Am I causing more conflict than there needs to be? Am I not expecting what is fair to expect of this person who doesn't have the same cognition as before? Um, I have lost something here. Have I spent time learning to reconcile what has been lost? There's a lot going on and sometimes the caregiver is not able to look after their own safety, feeling loved, feeling happy, feeling healthy. And what can happen is that in trying to do the best job of caregiving that the, that the caregiver can, he or she and the patient who has the dementia become isolated from everybody else. And that is a difficult road to go down. Regardless of whether you're the patient with dementia or you're the person who is still well and trying to provide care, loneliness, isolation can contribute to cognitive impairment. And there are actually quite a few more papers out now than there were five years ago on this topic. And I'm not going to read every word to you because we don't have time today, but the references are here and they are available in the downloadable PDF. So you can check them out um, on your own. Uh, I give you here the, um, the figures for a large study conducted in the US. Uh, not only the usual participants in, in studies who are Caucasian and highly educated, but we had both blacks and whites in this study. And if there was a, um, a finding of loneliness, 10 years later, there were going to be some accelerated reports of cognitive decline. And this is separate from depression. Often, often these things travel together, but loneliness is a thing. In China, similar finding. In Singapore, among Chinese, Malaysian, and Indian uh, elders over 60 years. Um, this was sort of the, the other side of the coin. When you have more happiness, you tend to have more resilient cognition over time. Um, and disability led to less happiness, of course. Um, and, and this disability was actually more significant than depression um, or loneliness. Um, but you could counterbalance by having frequent contact with friends. And so um, this, again, speaks to how much are you isolating yourself? How can we help people to not feel so isolated? In Spain, similar findings. I'm gonna to get to the next slide here. Now, when we think about diverse populations, it's not just about color of skin. It also has to do with urban, suburban, or rural. And this is a humongous, uh, oops, sorry, Brian, I'm not ready for you yet. <laughs> Gotta go backwards. Uh, uh, so, so rural elderly women, who had severe or extreme social exclusion were 23 times more likely to have cognitive impairment. That's stunning to me. Um, and then there's sexual orientation. Effects on the LGBTQ community apply here. And that may have to do with um, having lost family ties. Um, there are different reasons to have isolation uh, as part of their lives. Um, in addition to trying to care for someone who has cognitive impairment or dementia. 
I want to, before I hand it over to Brian, end on a uh, bright note for those of us who are single. Um, being single doesn't mean that we are doomed to feel isolated as we age. Um, it's the quality of your relationship um, that really helps. And if you feel neglected and rejected in your spousal relationship, then you have a very high risk of developing mild cognitive impairment over time. And um, even those who are isolated from family and reporting more emotional loneliness can be buoyed up by the fact that they are not also more isolated from their friends. And they did not, therefore, experience more social loneliness. They get out there, they have social activities. And so these are very important. And on that note, I am gonna hand over now to Brian. I'm stopping the share. Go ahead, Brian, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Tiffany. Let me transition to the slides here. Great. Hi, I'm Brian and I am an Episcopal priest and the chaplain at Montecedro, which is a retirement community that's in Altadena. And so today I just want to talk a little bit about living in community and really addressing the, the isolation that we're talking about um, that can occur. Uh, the question that I posed, how are the stigmas associated with dementia and death keeping people apart? Well, in our community, what I found is that the residents, when it comes to, to death, don't want to talk about it. And this is really that stigma associated with death. Our average age is probably about 86 years old. And so a lot of the residents are nearing the end of their life and still um, don't want to talk about death at all. And this shows up in conversations with the family uh, and you know, making plans as well as just having those, um, those last conversations. In the area of dementia, that's also uh, another really challenging conversation in the community. Uh, residents have been resistant to um, speaking to doctors, um, getting therapy. There's concern that if you have any memory loss at all, that you'll be removed from your home and locked up. And so there's a lot of fear there uh, about having dementia. And so one of the things that I saw when I started in the community is how do we address this? And you know, when it comes to having conversations about death and dementia, people are concerned about people having empathy and compassion. And that question comes up, is it possible to teach someone how to be compassionate? And I say the answer is yes. And I think that through education and through volunteering, that, that conversation can really grow in community. And so uh, I wanna share an idea with you. Um, let's see. I'm trying to get, oh, there we go. So when I came to Montecedro, a program called By Your Side had been started several years um, before I got there. And when I arrived, they were just about to launch it in the, at Montecedro. And this particular program was put together to, um, it was put together by the Episcopal Communities and Service Pastoral Department to really support people at the end of life. It's an end of life vigil companioning um, program with volunteering and training. And it organically emerged at Montecedro into something new. And I thought it's important to share this because whether you want to take on trying by your side and um, Susan Brown, who's the administrator and puts on the courses is always open for questions or including you in a training. But I think the idea today as well is considering, is this kind of program something you can do in uh, the community where you're at or where you're working? Because I think it can really support people in transforming the conversation around both death and dementia. And so I just wanted to show you a few of the, uh, the program guidelines. The program is a five week course. There are five two hour courses. And inside the course, there's education on the practical, the medical, emotional, and spiritual challenges of the process of end of life. And really at the heart of that, that idea of teaching compassion is found in the exercises of listening and self-reflection. Uh, one of the exercises is, uh, is sharing an experience of death with someone else. 
And in that, each participant gets partnered off and they have about five minutes to share, while the other in that group just listens. No questions, no asking, just listens. And part of that process really starts that, um, that evolution and understanding about how to be more compassionate if you don't feel like you're someone who has a lot of compassion. And so we offer a volunteer opportunity at the end. You can volunteer or not volunteer. And the, way that, the reason why we did that is because some people, you know, they're not comfortable. They're not ready to volunteer yet. And so that's fine. So anyone that's taken the program is invited to come to our quarterly meeting where we both have an update by volunteers and how they're doing, as well as an education piece. And so when someone feels comfortable, if they want to dip their toe in the volunteering waters, they can and participate. If not, they can just be part of this conversation within our community. And so what we've seen uh, after four years, we've had five classes. And most recently, we've done a course over Zoom that was very successful. We have a group of volunteers that gravitated towards their volunteering being in the courtyards. And the courtyards is our 20 bed memory unit. And so in being with residents that, uh, and volunteering with residents that have dementia, it's really changed the direction of the community. When I started, residents would refer to the courtyards, which is geographically located at the bottom of the building. It's south facing. It's beautiful, there's a beautiful garden, there's lots of sun, but it is at the bottom. And so residents would refer to it as going down there. And so through the volunteering process, that, that conversation is disappearing. And those that are volunteering are able to be advocates in the community and share with one another their experience and you know, really just educate one another. In the area of death, and having those stigmas break down, residents are now taking the program so that they can support one another. There's actually a resident recently that took the class and asked a friend to take it with them just so they could have that person be with them at the end of their life and support them in that conversation. So we're seeing an amazing transformation in the community through this program. Uh, and for me as a chaplain, it's really lifted the weight of being the end all be all when it comes to having all these conversations with the community engaged in talking with one another and supporting one another with um, the end of their life, as well as the fears that they have with dementia. The, uh, the anxiety is starting to melt away in the community and there's, a, um, there's just a new community forming out of it that's really beautiful. And so I hope this is something that you'd uh, consider or look at and uh, welcome any questions at all. And thank you very much. This is my piece of the presentation. I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Yuri Jang. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yuri Zhang. I am a professor in the USC School of Social Work and the senior scientist at the Roiber Institute on Aging. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, I'll be speaking about Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, ADRD, in Asian American communities. Let me start with some background. About 6 million Americans are affected by ADRD, and the social cost of ADRD is fairly high. And it's also important to note that many ADRD patients are being cared by their family members and friends who are unpaid. If we translate their work into dollar amount, it's almost 244 billion. So the ADRD has a pervasive impact at both individual and societal level. According to the MetLife survey, ADRD is the second most feared disease after cancer, but many people are not uh, knowledgeable about this disease, and even fewer people have made any plans for the possibility having, uh, of having this disease. So the ADRD literacy and planning is uh, particularly low among the uh, racial ethnic minority populations. And speaking about disparities, Individuals with a racial ethnic minority background, they are more likely to have delayed diagnosis and underutilization of services. Uh, and Hispanic white, 
and not much is, no, is known about the Asian American population, which is the fastest growing segment of the US population. So the first study that I want to share is the Asian American Quality of Life Survey, which was done in Austin, Texas in 2015 as a special initiative of the city of Austin. So what you see on the screen is the official logo of the project. Asian Americans are diverse group. So the, but the common thing might be the love for rice. So what you have, what you see here is the uh, grain, rice, grain uh, rice plants, and the diversity is uh, presented by different colors of the grain. And the, the circular pattern represents harmony, unification, and prosperity. So we uh, you employed culturally and linguistically sensitive approach by using Asian language versions of the survey questionnaire, bilingual, bicultural survey assistance, and the community partnership. So we developed the questionnaire in English first and then translated into many different Asian uh, languages. So to, keep, to give you some flavor, this is the simple translation of Asian American quality of life into many Asian languages. And I have a few pictures from the survey site, uh, the churches and the Asian grocery store. Uh, we had enthusiastic response from the community members, as you can see here. And we literally uh, transformed store entrance into a library. So people were seriously taking this opportunity as a way that they can express their concerns uh, for the uh, community. So sometimes we had outdoor set setting uh, in hot summer weather. And this is the cultural festival uh, for the uh, Filipino communities. So we, we, our sample included uh, more than 2,600 participants from diverse groups. And as a part of this survey, we had some items on ADRD. So we found that about 18% of the sample uh, had concerns about ADRD and 11% had some plans uh, about the ADRD, such as designation of their care providers, consideration of care options, family conversations, and, and uh, financial arrangement. And these uh, rates are consistently lower than uh, what was found in the National MetLife Survey. So we also had some information about uh, st stigmatizing beliefs. About half of the sample uh, believe that ADRD is a normal process of aging, and 14% uh, think developing AD is a matter of faith, and 6% of the sample associated AD with social avoidance or family uh, embarrassment, and 30% indicated a strong objection to nursing home placement of a family member with ADRD. And our analysis showed that individuals with low education and acculturation, meaning that those who are less familiarized to the language and culture of the mainstream society, they were more likely uh, subject to the stigmatizing beliefs. And such, is, such stigmatizing beliefs made people more concerned about AD. However, the concern did not necessarily translate into actions. So there was some kind of the uh, intervention uh, implication over there. So the, our finding uh, suggested that the importance of educational program for the ADRD awareness and stigma reduction. And also uh, we have to pay special attention to those with low education and acculturation to meet their special needs. And also there should be some efforts to leverage AD concerns into positive behavioral uh, outcomes. The second study that I want to share uh, focused on older Korean Americans, and we examined the role of social capital in predicting AD uh, knowledge and service awareness. So the many studies, including my own, showed the positive impact of education and acculturation, which are personal levels of resources. So building upon this literature, uh, we focus on the interpersonal and community levels of social capital, such as uh, knowing uh, someone with the, the Alzheimer's disease and related dementia among the family and friends, social network, social activity participation, and the community social cohesion. The SOCA survey was conducted with more than 2,100 older Korean Americans in five states, California, New York, Texas, Hawaii, and Florida, and representing a wide range of population, Korean American population density from high to low. So our finding 
confirmed, not only confirmed the benefit of education and education, but also showed the significant role of uh, social capital uh, resources, uh, such as prior exposure to AD, social network and activity participation uh, turned out to be significant factor. So the implication is that interventions to improve AD literacy and service awareness should consider socio-cultural context. And also there should be special attention to those who are socially isolated and disconnected from the communities. The last study that I want to share is a qualitative study on ADRD caregiving in linguistic and social isolation. We, we conducted in-depth interviews with multiple stakeholders, including three service providers in ADRD service agencies, five service providers in Korean specific uh, social service agencies, and five Korean American caregivers of a family member with ADRD. So we conducted a uh, nine minute in-depth interview with each participant. And I wanna share major findings from these interviews. The first, the providers in ADRD service agencies uh, expressed their challenges in reaching out to ethnic communities. One provider said, we haven't successfully reached out to Korean American caregivers. It's primarily because we don't have staff representing Korean communities. We only have a few volunteers who speak Korean. Without bilingual and bicultural staff, it's hard to build the connections. On the other hand, providers in Korean uh, service agency express their discomfort with the lack of specialty training. One provider said, our program is pretty much geared towards uh, uh, healthy older adults, keeping them active and happy. Providing service to those with dementia uh, is beyond the capacity of our center. Sometimes we just let their children know what's going on with, uh, with them. It all becomes their family decision. Cultural stigma is also mentioned. Our members don't talk much about ADRD, but what I can tell you is that most of them worry about it because they don't want to burden their children. We also had a, a rich conversations with uh, caregivers and major important things uh, emerged and some of them are about social isolation, informational needs, and emotional needs. And these are the, some exemplary quotes from the interviews. I feel extremely isolated. Um, my social life has been totally cut off since I started taking care of my mom. And another one said, I had to figure out everything on my own. Uh, now I know a bit about the disease and how to handle my mom, but I had to learn the hard way. I wish, there, uh, I wish someone had told me. I had to spend so much of my time and emotion in figuring things out. Another caregiver said, I wish there is something like a small group meeting where people like me share information and know-hows. I often wonder how other people do their caregiving, but I haven't met anyone yet. So this is indication of the caregiving in isolation. Another one said, it will, it will be great to get to know other caregivers in Korean communities. Sometimes I just want to talk with somebody who understand what I'm going through. So the, there is a, the high levels of emotional needs. The last one is that uh, saying that having this interview is actually a treat for me. Uh, this is my getaway from my everyday caregiving routine. And actually this quote is from a caregiver who provides 24 seven care to her mother-in-law who, who needs to have snacks and meals every three hours. So having this all together, there is a strong need to build interagency partnerships for specialty service referrals and cultural and linguistic support. And caregiver support programs are in need, such as caregiver education and counseling, uh, respite service, and peer support group. As Brian mentioned earlier, peer support plays a significant role. So the many caregivers would benefit from the feeling that they are not alone and they would be build some sort of the sense of community uh, through peer support. And when working with this population, cultural and linguistic accommodation should be carefully considered. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my funding agencies and thank you for uh, your attention. And I will turn it over to Tiffany. All right, uh, so I'm back um, and I'm going to go from here. Hopefully this will work. Um, so I, um, I think 
um, we've, we've rehearsed this talk a little bit before presenting it to you today. Um, and today I'm hearing uh, a different emphasis um, that ties us all together, which I think is the importance of sharing stories. Sharing our personal stories can help to humanize the challenges that people are facing. Sharing stories can be a very effective means of training people to um, show their empathy uh, because they can understand the storyteller's point of view and consider, gee, that's interesting. That's different from mine. Do I want to learn from this story or do I want to add my own story? Uh, and I, I think that's so valuable. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has been trying to create caregiver support groups um, for decades now. Uh, and in Los Angeles, I've been very impressed with their work to offer these in different languages. But as Yuri points out, across the nation, there is, are lots of pockets where this kind of support has just not been developed yet. Um, so coming back to my safe, loved, happy, and healthy, not necessarily in that order, um, I would encourage people to think of stories where that happened, where they did something small that allowed the patient that, for whom they are caring to feel safe, happy, healthy, or loved, and hopefully all four. Um, sometimes I need to put this in a very um, practical format for caregivers who come into the clinic. And so I try to remind them that feeling healthy might be just to feel free of pain. Uh, anybody out there who's had chronic pain or a headache that goes on for a few days understands that as soon as that siren is not playing, wow, what a feeling of well being. Uh, so, this is an important thing for the caregiver to understand um, if there is something causing pain, which can also uh, create cognitive impairment or behavioral changes, and try to get help to relieve that pain. Try to help the patient to remain safe and autonomous as much as possible, as is safe, and then to create maybe adapted activities, maybe not doing the yard work that they used to do 20 years ago, but having the pleasure of trimming the twigs off of a plant, um, reshaping. Um, these are things that may not complete a task, uh, but they may be meaningful nonetheless. Um, and there are some fantastic materials out there. I'm happy to um, field any questions about uh, more details on that. Um, and then the safe happy, healthy, and loved for the caregivers, we as the healthcare professionals need to enable them to feel that they are having some sort of meaningful interaction with the person for whom they are caring. Um, that could be to enable an emotional connection between the two. It could be that reminding them that a simple act such as being able to feed that person a meal is incredibly important and not to be taken for granted. Um, there are dyads of patients and caregivers where that is very difficult or it, it has become unsafe because the patient can't swallow safely anymore. Um, the other thing that um, usually can blow people away is, you know, it's okay to sit in the same room and watch TV together. If there's a favorite um, sports team uh, or a movie that you know this person loves, just to be unhassled not to be nagged and to be able to enjoy a simple pleasure is, is so important. Uh, and then also reassuring them that we are keeping an eye on all the medications that are available, that everything that can be done by the caregiver is being done. Really important for that caregiver to feel happy and not self-critical about uh, whether they are a good caregiver or a bad caregiver. And then as we've been saying, try to eliminate any feelings of isolation that may be arising. So um, for people on the, uh, on the conference today who are, um, who are themselves taking care of somebody else, whether professionally or not, um, here are some items. Um, uh, Dr. Chopra in the keynote comments um, was talking about gut intelligence. And I think what you're putting in there is important. Um, your sense of whether you're taking good care of yourself has to do with your diet. So think about that. Are you getting some physical activity? Um, not everybody needs as much physical activity, but it is an important part of COVID survival, I think, is to be able to exercise in a safe way. Um, 
Unfortunately, it's not the same social activity as it might have been in the past, but it is still important. We all have stress. Some of us choose the kind of stress we have, but it's still stress. So you need to make sure you understand where all the stress is coming from and then manage it. Um, social networks we've been talking about during this whole hour. At the last point is about music. And uh, I am going to go from this session right over to um, Nels de Mol van Otterloo, um, who's gonna talk about music therapy in the context of aging and, and dementia. And he's going around the world to study this. Um, there is a music room as part of the conference. I am surprised that there are not more musical entries to choose from, but there's one that um, Dr. Uh, Reverend O'Rourke and I have put together for your delectation. Um, my Tycho group has also made an offering. Brian uh, plays the ukulele for one of the programs at Montecedro. Do you want to tell me more about that? Yeah, you know, I, I do a service at Montecedro for the uh, Christian residents there and do one for the memory unit. And I learned how to play ukulele a few years ago and have started uh, playing ukulele. And that's really the highlight of the service for the, uh, the residents that participate. And it's it's amazing to see a, 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 a person who's not really able to say much or interact and you will play a song and out of nowhere um, that, that um, resident, I'm thinking of one in particular and she will just, she'll come alive and just start singing the song and people look, it's like, people are like, where is this coming from? <laughs> it's, just, it's magical. So anyways, yeah, the, the music is definitely um, a powerful force, especially in the area of dementia. So. Yeah, now um, music is one of those, I call them back doors. One of those back doors to help people access different kinds of memories. And um, that can backfire on you. So you really wanna know the person before you start playing music at them or with them. But um, it's, it's so wonderful to see somebody express their own personality through music when other, when other means of communication have, um, have declined. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, so I have not seen any questions or comments come out in the chat window, but I do have a question for both of you. Um, and that is, um, it, I'm, I'm involved in the Asian cohort for Alzheimer's disease, where we're going to try to get genomic samples from uh, a large number of Asian Americans. And in our plans, we have written in that we're going to work with community advisory boards. Now, Yuri, you had so many participants from different Asian subgroups. I wonder, did you have community advisory boards and how did you organize all of that? Yes, uh, for the two projects that I shared, I had a very strong community advisors and actually it takes time to build the connections. Uh, so it's a trust and also the inter kind of the, uh, it shouldn't be one way, but mutually beneficial. So it's uh, a lot of work involved and the emotion as well. So I had a good uh, body of students who volunteer for those ethnic organizations. And it takes time for us to build the trust. And when we're ready for the uh, big project, and actually we had enthusiastic response and support from community organizer, uh, the organizations and leadership and the leadership from the ethnic communities and also religious organizations mm -hmm. had a strong power and engagement. So they speak uh, the project for us and it was much more uh, strong, kind of make a strong message that can bring the community members uh, participate in, in the project. So I think it's an essential uh, necessary step for the community engaged uh, participatory research to build those connections. So I'm thinking of many religious organizations and ethnic organizations, uh, and also the media, ethnic media. They have strong uh, connections with the community members. And uh, yeah, it was the instrumenter for make my data collection and project successful. 2,600 of anybody is a large, large number of people and a huge data set. Um, and, uh, Marie Andrea Enriquez, thank you for putting a comment in. Um, educational interventions in the Asian American community. Uh, yeah, I've been working on that for a while now. Um, and Australia has a bunch of really fantastically translated materials. Um, it's the Alzheimer's Society of Australia, uh, New South Wales. 
that has put together, and I don't know if they've updated them recently, but um, there are some great resources there. Um, I had created a website for kids, for teenagers who have parents with um, early onset dementia. And we translated that into simplified and uh, traditional Chinese characters. Um, and that is about to be rebooted in a little while. But um, yeah, now we're trying to do all that we can to, to help with that. There's another organization called CARE, C-A-R-E, uh, run by my friend Van Park at UC San Francisco. Um, and uh, yeah, the immigrant, Asian immigrant story is a complicated one um, because we all have different historic events that have led to uh, immigration in the last 20 years. Um, and so it is definitely something that our group is trying to uh, bring to the attention of the Alzheimer's Association to help them create the right materials. And I've had um, Yuri and Brian um, both please jump in on this. I had um, one of our Korean community advisory board people tell share with us that there is a lot of pride uh, and, and, and the flip side of pride could be shame uh, when uh, discussing childhood traumas or stressors that may have actually increased the risk for dementia. So there's a lot of homework for us to do. Yuri, would you like to comment more on that? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm looking at the, uh, the chat uh, discussion. Yeah, I know that the, uh, for the especially Asian American communities, uh, the language and actually the citizenship, the eligibility for a certain social services, it comes a, a huge barrier. But there are many nonprofit agencies uh, trying to offer those uh, services uh, without any restriction in terms of the eligibility. So for example, uh, Alzheimer's LA, they provide lots of informational and uh, the educational programs as well. So uh, try to reach out, kind of expand the uh, potential source of support that would be good. And it's just really speaking about how we build our pipeline uh, to be able to share these benefits uh, in a fair way. So the, despite language barriers and cultural barriers, we should bring everybody together to combat this kind of the social uh, epidemic uh, problems. So I think the comments uh, coming in the, into the chat, it's really speaking about where we stand. Thank you. Uh, Brian, um, what, would, what would you say to uh, Marie? Um, about the education, I, I just, uh, I'm completely agreeing. I think, I mean, it's what's coming to mind in my own community um, is, is trying to get those same resources that are there, they are abundant, you know, and they are there, but how do we put them into people's hands and have them use it? And that becomes the challenging um, piece of it. How do we, how do we again, break down those stigmas that keep people from um, even looking for help? Um, not not feeling ashamed of it. So um, I, you know, I think that's what we're talking about today. At the heart of it is really encouraging those conversations. I appreciate um, your uh, sharing with us that you and your sister are um, working more than maybe you ordinarily would. Um, this is one of those stressors that you have chosen. This is a worthwhile. Um, source of stress, um, but I'm hoping that um, at least you and your sister are able to check in with each other and debrief to each other. And if that's not possible, then you, you have other people to contact, um, I hope, who would be happy to listen. They don't have to fix it, but it helps so much to have somebody listen to you. And um, Brian's By Your Side program trains people to not feel like they have to fix something, but they need to be present. Be present enough to listen and listen kindly, listen deeply. Um, and I think that that can help so much. I hope you have that available to you. Um, let's see, uh, another thing that, that uh, I remember, I, I grew up in Los Angeles and I remember uh, my grade school was near a Korean American church. And so I understand that to be a, a big part of the life. Um, it's a source of spirituality um, and, uh, and, and community gathering. Um, Brian, I, you being the reverend in the group, I, I would like to call upon you to think about, you know, what are some of the spiritual angles on 
life with someone who has dementia in your household? Yeah, that's something that's, uh, you know, a lot of people think that when you have dementia, you, you know, not only lose function in speaking and abilities, um, but also in your spiritual ability. And so I, I don't think that's the case. I, you know, I, I have a hard time um, applying a label to say that when somebody has dementia, um, that they don't have a spiritual life. And I, and I mean that because when I shared about Here's an example. When I share about uh, playing music at the service, there's also um, there's also people. Re there's two residents I can think of. They begin to cry when they hear the music, and um, and I and I know that it's it's unlocking something and opening something there. And when I've tried to speak with them about it, they're not able to do it. But I know that there's something. Ha there's a there's a spiritual process going on. Um, there, you know, we we talk about in the Buddhist practice of letting go of you know, whatever it is and living in the moment. And I, and I always think, you know, those that have dementia have a, you know, biological ability to live in the moment more fully than we can even comprehend. So, you know, what is it for that person? So to, to assume we understand that, I don't think is, I think that that's bad. I try to um, imagine what spiritual awakening one might be having in that place and, um, and give them that in my support in the community there, so. That's been, that's, that's kind of my thinking. I think that helps. I think that not trying to project uh, a line of thinking or a mood onto the person who has cognitive impairment, who isn't as able to communicate as, as well as before, creates a space yeah. where everybody can be together. Um, I remember when my dad was in the hospital, um, and Christopher, you're gonna to have to signal me on time because I can't see it on my screen. Um, when my dad was in the hospital and he was just kind of sitting in bed, not necessarily even watching the TV. And at any given time, my mom or my brother or I would be sitting in the room with him. And I was typing away on my laptop, doing work from inside the hospital, blah, blah, blah. I was so busy. And then I realized, you know, wow, is he awake? And yeah, he was just sitting there in bed. So I said, so with all this time <laughs> that you have, um, what you've been thinking about? And he said, nothing. Am I supposed to be thinking about something? And I said, no, not at all. I'm just sort of like wowed. Um, you know, my dad's the big Lebowski. He's in the Zen place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've, I've encountered that a lot with people being able to be in a prayerful place. And there, you know, there's a there's a, a, a resident that I think might have Lewy body dementia. And if you've been with people that have that, it can, you know, have a lot of, um, um, you know, visions and hallucinations and anxiety. And, and I'll see that, um, that resident go into, and this is a, a Buddhist that has practiced for 40 years prior. Just, I, I was with that person this week and they were just, they were sitting with their finger on their heart in this meditative place. And I've noticed just their ability to not get anxious and to and and to get through it in a way I haven't seen in other people. And so I'm not, you know, I've seen a lot of people wrestle with it, but there's something there. And the same with just a, that prayerful state. I've I've been with residents who are still able to pray and get into that 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 place where they could calm themselves. And it's it's very sacred. And that that spiritual mind, I think, is similar to the music mind. I think there's a, a spiritual memory or place that would is worthy of exploring that we haven't um, got to um, that is 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 working and at work inside of us and those that have dementia. It's in the left temporal lobe. It, oh, it's well, it's there. Yeah, <laughs> 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 this is very interesting work. Yeah. Um, when people have a seizure of a particular place in the left temporal lobe, um, or a brain tumor there, they will actually become much more religious in focus um, and, and speak about it and write about it. And um, it's, 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 I'm sure spirituality doesn't live in just one place in the brain. I mean, you know, the, the monks yeah. will say it's in the heart, it's not in their head. In but um, but it's, it's, it is a fascinating thing. Um, there's organized religion and then there's spirituality and there's a big overlap between the two obviously yeah. but um 
Yeah. Now the um, when caregivers go through the journey of being horrified that there is a diagnosis of dementia, and then somehow turning a corner and realizing they can still work with this, that there's a lot of meaning to be had in the challenge of facing it. Um, there's a serious spirituality that has taken over um, the, the, the grandness of um, life and, and all the changes. Uh, so this is, I think this has been a great conference for us to be um, uh, presenting at. Um, I am not seeing any further questions in the chat window. Um, Brian or Yuri, do you have any further closing comments that you would like to make? No. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's been my joy to share my uh, study findings and kind of communicate with other presenters. And yeah, it's an important issue that we have not just the older populations, but the entire population for caregiving needs and as a future generations of getting into the older population. I think it's, this is a public health issue. <laughs>